is Todrick Johnson with Epitome Magazine, and we are here in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Ending Mass Incarceration Conference here at the Martin Luther King Center. We want to take you guys on a powerful journey as we look into mass incarceration. You're going to experience some powerful messages, some powerful people, and some powerful testimonies here on Epitome TV. You guys, come on. I'm a pastor who's always very focused on justice issues. I actually see justice as a central theme in scripture. And the work of justice making in the world, uh, for me, is central to what it means to do ministry. My name is A.C. Brown. I spent a total of, say, six months in solitary confinement at different times. My goal is to bring um, awareness to the torture that we experience there, the psychological effects, the inhumane effects, the things that these people go through on a day to day that nobody knows. If you haven't experienced it, it's just hushed and put under the carpet from the mistreatment by the CEOs to the other inmates to just the psychological effect of seeing having no human contact for a prolonged period of time. But also as a child of the black church and pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, a church with a uh, legendary history of being engaged in, in these issues, uh, that actually provides a platform and a context to engage this work and to do the kind of uh, advocacy that I'd be trying to do anyway. Uh, I see mass incarceration as uh, the central moral domestic issue of our time. strength and courage to call up to the PD and say, look, this officer continues to have a discovery issue. Why is it that we can never find the in-car camera, sir? And now we're going to have a discovery here because we need to talk about why this is a problem, but you have to have people on the bench willing to have that tough conversation. A lot of people here understand the issue of mass incarceration, but what we're trying to do is help people to understand the power that they have to do something about it, and not just that they have, that that we have, right? So um, that's what I like to see, that there's some collaborative movement building spirit here about what's possible. Um, there is, it, it, there are a number of issues that confront African American people, people of color, poor people, but the criminal justice system is not just one issue alongside others. It is uh, a primary, the primary driving force through which the tragedy of uh, uh, racialized oppression continues in America. And if we do not dismantle this system of mass incarceration, which is the latest iteration of the social control of black bodies since 1619, uh, in the new world. Uh, we will not have done our work in our generation. Pastor Warnock says that, uh, I heard him say once that uh, this cause was near and dear to his heart, uh, both for personal reasons and for ethical reasons. And when I heard him say that, uh, it really framed my own story. And, uh, and I began to just kind of think about my journey uh, with mass incarceration and, uh, and having experienced it at a young age with my brother being in and out of mass incarceration, uh, jails and prison. He had a, an addiction, a drug addiction to crack cocaine and, uh, and was caught up in this whole war on drugs. And I remember as a young teenager um, uh, just, just wanting to save my brother 
my big brother who was a former professional football player in the National Football League and and my big brother that had a nightclub and I was the most popular girl in the seventh grade because I was the only girl having parties in the nightclub and my big brother who drove me to school in my Jaguar and, and I just remember when he was hurt and he had he started taking pain medications for his knee and it just went on and on and on. was thrust in front of the media and the public as a 15-year-old child, seen as a, a villain, seen as a, the scum of the earth, a pariah. You know, 15, I mean, 13 years later, the truth comes out. But it comes out in a way that was really interesting. Juxtaposed against the way the truth came out was that in 1989, there were over 400 articles written about us, tearing apart our lives, no one asking us to participate in those interviews. But all of these articles were describing me and the rest of my so-called co-defendants in a way that was really um, evil. I think that's the right way to say it. You know, and 13 years later, when the truth came out, it was a whisper that you almost wondered if the rats in New York City had even heard. Many folks thought we were still in prison. Some folks uh, said, oh, Central Park Five are here. Is, is that a music group? You know, so it's a really pleasant honor 30 years later to not only be celebrated in America in the way that we are being celebrated, but around the globe. One of the things in prison that you will notice is that sometimes you'll meet men who've been there for like two and like four years, and when they come out, the effects are visible. So what we want to say, what we would like to do is we want to change this. Maybe there would be some other alternatives and something we can do to maybe make this a thing of the past. We're one of the few countries, I'm correct, that still engages in this kind of behavior. Uh, one of the main objectives is to create a network of congregations across faith traditions who are engaged in this work. and. Um, we are hopeful based on what we've already seen in the last day and a half here at the conference. As I move around, uh, people have been waiting for something like this. And they seem excited and, and I feel something bubbling. Uh, there's something percolating. And uh, we've been very intentional about developing a faith toolkit so that people can have very practical ways of sinking their teeth into this issue and in, uh, engaging the issue. So, so one of the things we, we uh, are, are pushing is this faith toolkit that will teach congregations how to collaborate in their area with um, government uh, in order to have expungement events, for example. Uh, to collaborate with each other to do um, bail release campaigns. Now, none of these things will end mass incarceration. We're clear about that. system that stands behind them that says, you know, we'd rather have you occupy a jail cell than a college dorm. And, and it's hard to get justice when our people are still faced with that constantly, right? And, and so we feel like, when do we get justice? Hopefully when we make an impact in the system. And the greatest human rights tragedy that's facing our nation today and that's mass incarceration, and the effect that it has on 2.3 million Americans every single day. This uh, amazing uh, production ought to be seen uh, is as a prism into the larger landscape uh, of what's wrong in our country in this moment. If we focus on them and only see them, uh, ironically, we miss yes. the message of the movement yes. when they see us. Yes. The us is larger than the Central Park Five. Uh, the us is even larger than those who are locked up in uh, America's prisons and jails. The us has to do with uh, the ways in which poor people are, are criminalized uh, and blackness is seen as inherent criminality uh, in the United States of America. That, that's the, the issue that we've got to deal with. It's, it's a political it is an issue that has political manifestations, but at root it's a, it's a deep spiritual and cultural problem. Hmm. One thing my 
grandmother, God bless her soul, always told me, she called me by all three of my names. She would say, Billy Michael Oliver, always read the fine print, baby. <laughs> when you deal in this country and you study our documents, you gotta read the fine print. Listen to what it says. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, watch this, comma, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall be duly convicted shall exist within the united states or any place of its jurisdiction but what it will do is to begin to raise the issue within the public square and as we raise the issue we can call for meaningful transformation in our country i, I think that uh, one of the glimmers of hope with respect to this issue is that it is an issue where there is agreement on the right and the left that the current system is unsustainable. Um, but we can't rest on our laurels and trust that consensus to get us to the right place. No, we've got to fight. We've got to be engaged. Otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise we may end up with a more sophisticated, technologically advanced form of social control, as Michelle Alexander said to us this week. I think she's absolutely right. And it's something that I've been worried about. So people on the left and the right, people of faith, people of moral courage, uh, have to be engaged uh, uh, on this issue. Otherwise, one tragically could imagine a scenario under which the American carceral system while appearing to be more benign and less inhumane, could actually grow. We're already, uh, we already have the dubious distinction of warehousing 25% of the world's prisoners. I'm afraid that if we aren't vigilant on this issue, if people of faith aren't engaged, and if we aren't sophisticated in the ways in which we talk about the issue and advocate for change, we could end up with a system that's even larger than the current. And uh, that's the challenge before us. Uh, the good news is that we're here this week and um, we're making connections. And um, listen, it's, it's, uh, you're going after the beast as it were. Um, but I come from a faith tradition where David slay Goliaths and um, you know, prophets speak truth to power. Jesus is crucified on a Friday, but the resurrection comes, it says that uh, injustice will never have the last word. And it's that faith, I think, that propels us forward, uh, even in the face of the formidable challenge. My message is very simple. Never give up. I saw a picture of a pelican with a frog in its mouth. And the pelican was eating the frog but the frog had the pelican by the throat. And the caption underneath it was never give up. I was told that when you're walking through hell, keep on walking. We are the answer that we seek. All we have to do is recognize that. And here we are today at Ebenezer Baptist Church, making sure that mass incarceration and the effects of it are being exposed. Hey guys, we are still here at the Ending Mass Incarceration Conference, and we have this young lady with us. And what's your name? Madeline McKinney. Miss Madeline McKinney. So, what are you doing here for this, at this conference? So, I was one of the keynote speakers um, on Tuesday night. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And what did you talk about? Well, I was asked to address the importance of faith in the movement, and so I came from Luke chapter seven. John the Baptist raised the question when he was in prison, are you the one asking Jesus or should we look for another? So we've got millions of people in prison wondering, is this the church, are these the believers who are the ones to come rescue us or should they look for another? Hey, this is Todrick Johnson with Epitome TV. We're now at the end of ending mass incarceration conference. We had an awesome time. I hope your experience was good as well. But next year, you need to make sure you be here. Take care of yourself, and we'll see you soon.